Well, let's pray this morning and invite our teacher. Holy Spirit, we just welcome you, sir. We thank you for your presence that is here now to breathe upon the word, to cause the word to become alive on the inside of us. We know that without you, we cannot fully comprehend God's word. We cannot fully estimate what is available to us. But as you breathe on this word this morning and you cause it to become alive on the inside of us, all of a sudden we begin to see the kingdom. Jesus, you told Nicodemus that unless someone's born again of the Spirit, they can't see or even enter the kingdom of God. And so, Holy Spirit, you do the work this morning of helping us see the kingdom and enter the kingdom. And for anyone here, Holy Spirit, this morning that has not been born again, I pray that you bear witness in their hearts that the words we speak our truth. We're not here to give a history lesson. We're here to talk about the living God who is present now with us in this room, who's desiring to see his family even get bigger. Lord, as that beautiful song was sang this morning, you are Father and you are good. And then we sang... And we are loved by you. We thank you that that's true today. I pray that truth goes into every heart in this place. And of course, we pray this in that wonderful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. We've been doing this series on Sunday morning. I'm calling it the two kinds of life. And we've been talking about bios, which is biological life. You as a human being, and then Zoe. Zoe is the God kind of life. It's eternal life. It's the life that comes from the Spirit. We have a heart. We have organs in our body. We have a brain. We have this system that works together we call our body. But then God breathed a breath of life into this body and made it a living soul. And through the fall of man in the garden, the soul and the spirit became entangled. Before the fall of man, we were governed by the word of God. And that's the way we were designed to be governed, by the word of God. You know, I was uh, trying to replace a headlight in my car yesterday. And I've only had the car a short amount of time and I had a driving light out. And so I went down to the auto parts store and and, uh, I said, I need a headlight for a... 2012 Yukon and so the guy gave me a light bulb and I went to my house and got my toolbox out and first thing I realized I had to take the whole stinking bumper off to get to the headlight and then I got to the headlight and I opened it up and it was a completely different bulb than what the guy at the parts store gave me and I'm like huh so I go get in the car go back down to the parts store now I'm get running out of time because this 10-minute job had already taken an hour and a half now. So I finally I got the car all tore apart in the driveway. I go back to the parts store, and I took the bulb out of the car, and I walked up to the guy, and I said, you gave me the wrong bulb. And he looked at me, and he said, oh, no. And I said, what's that mean? And he goes, it means you're screwed. I went, well, what's that mean? And he said, Somebody's put an aftermarket lighting system in your car. And I don't know where you're going to get that bulb. You might have to look on the internet. I'm like, really? He said, yeah. You know, so what happens is when we leave the manufactured product and we start doing aftermarket stuff, are you, are you preaching ahead of me yet? Huh? It's kind of what happens to us when God designed us to work a certain way and then we decided to put an aftermarket part in. It was called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And we're screwed, basically, you know. Why why, why, Why do I experience pain? You're screwed. What do you mean? You done went aftermarket parts. You're not in the original manufacturer's design. And so whenever we leave the intent or what God designed us to be, we end up 
with parts that don't work. We were created to be governed by a spirit within us. Now, our spirit's eternal. Our spirit never dies. It can't die. God himself cannot kill your spirit. Why? That's what the word eternal means. When he created us in his image and likeness, the Bible says with him there's no beginning and no end. He can't die. He's a spirit. When he created us spirits and we can no longer cease to exist, we cannot die then he gave us a choice of how we would spend eternity, whether in his kingdom or living on our own. Well, when we decide to live on our own and we break the law, that makes us a criminal. And criminals have to be locked up. Why? Because they hurt people. They do bad things. And we have to protect society from criminals, so we have a place called the county jail. When someone's arrested arraigned they put them in a county jail and there they await judgment they wait to go to trial and then if they're found guilty they go to prison either state or federal prison for the determined sentence well that's how the world works but in the kingdom of God it's kind of like that too we were created eternal spirits and our spirits became criminal by disobeying God in the garden of Eden and then the Lord said because you're of the seed of Adam in Adam all have sinned and so the Lord, now we're condemned as eternal criminals. He can't just kill us. Why? You can't kill a spirit. You live forever. So he had to find a place to put us. And so he created a place called Hades or Gehenna or hell. And it's a place of the damned. It's a place where people who have been found guilty... They spend their time and they wait. Hell today is county jail for criminal spirits. Now there's coming a time in history where it's called the great white throne judgment. And there all the books are opened, all the history records of every human being. And there we give an account. And there anyone whose name was not found written in the Lamb's book of life, the Bible says, will be cast into the lake of fire with the devil and his angels where they will be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever. So the lake of fire is a prison, federal prison, for eternal criminals. What's your sentence? Eternity. That's why you don't want to miss this. This is one you don't want to miss. Now, just as our, you know, we're, we, we have a president now that has what, about two years left in office and before he gets out of office, he's going to do something because all presidents do this. Right before, like on the last couple of days of his presidency, he's going to issue a bunch of pardons. What's going to happen is there's going to be cases brought to him that there's good evidence that people were found guilty that weren't really guilty. Or there's been something extraordinary happen to where they truly believe that these folks are now, you know, they're okay. And they're not going to be a threat to society. And so the president has the power and the governor of a state have the power to pardon a criminal. So they can just sign a waiver and that guy is released and his sins are forgiven. Well, what God did to the human race, you know, there isn't a prisoner really anywhere in the state or federal penitentiaries that can just say, you know what, I choose uh, President Obama, let me have his number. Hey, Brock, how you doing, man? Good, I'm down here in the pen. Hey, I tell you what, I think I'll go ahead and take your pardon. You can't do that. You've got to have an advocate, an attorney, who can present your case in a way that is convincing enough to the president to allow you to be pardoned. So... The scripture kind of gives the same scenario for us. We were criminals. We had been found guilty. The Bible says all sin and come short of the glory of God. There isn't a person. It says our greatest acts of righteousness are yet filthy rags in the sight of God. All sinned. And then the scripture calls Jesus an advocate, an attorney. And he pled our case. He pled us out. He pled us out. And he got us a pardon. 
This is kind of a different scenario than the world system in the fact of this pardon he extended to all human beings and is all we have to do is meet the conditions of the pardon. What's the conditions? If you were to pardon a criminal and bring him out of prison, that I'm sure he would be charged with, okay, go and don't do that again. If you're in here for murder, don't you ever hurt anybody again. Well, Jesus looked at the people he pardoned and said, go and sin no more. I, I, I release you, I forgive you, but don't go out and do that again. Why? You're going to end up right back in here. You're going to end up right back in here. And so God gave us this great opportunity. We're spiritual beings. That's why God, there's so much at stake. This isn't a 10-year sentence we're talking about or a 20-year sentence or a 30-year sentence. This isn't even a life sentence. This is not a life sentence. This is an eternal sentence. So this one, we go a lot further. We, we plead a lot harder for all men to be reconciled to God. In fact, the scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that once that pardon is accepted in us, we become now advocates. And we, as advocates of God, go out to all the other criminals and say, we plead you on, the beha on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Come under the conditions of this pardon and live a life that is free. Amen. And that's the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, this message that says you can be free. Amen. You can be pardoned. And, and it's not just one. You know, if a president grants 50 pardons in his presidency, that's 50 out of hundreds of thousands of people. But this pardon is for everybody. It's for everybody. And the conditions of the pardon are in the scriptures. And Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 says this. I say then, walk in the spirit. Why? It's a spiritual pardon. Everything the Lord did for us is to cause us to come back under the government of the Spirit. To untangle the soul and its desires from us. We have to be divided. I divide myself daily. We, we, we incorporated the scripture in the last couple weeks several times. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is powerful. It's alive. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Dividing asunder between the soul and the spirit. So what happens is every morning we get up and we have to untangle our soul and our spirit. And we have to make decisions based on conclusions from God's word. That this is me being governed by the spirit. Spirit, and this is me being governed by my body or my soul. I have to see myself as a three-part being. That's why in Thessalonians, Paul said, I pray that you may be sanctified holy. Your spirit, your soul, and your body, all being set apart, separated unto God, which is our reasonable service, of course. That's why Romans says, do not be conformed to this world. The, the word world there, cosmos, means the system of the world, the system of the age, the pleasures of the age, the desires of the age. As Christians, we're not to be conformed to that. To be conformed means that you're formed into that or you form after that. But it says instead, be renewed in the spirit of your mind by the word of God that's why we have to have a daily communion we have to have a daily communication with God's word Amen. folks 80 percent of the body of Christ that we call Christians do not read their Bible they do not have an effective consistent life of prayer in fact, in a, in a study that was done clear back in the late 70s, it was concluded by Pulpit Magazine, Pulpit Helps Magazine. They, they polled 10,000 clergymen across all denominational lines. And they asked them, how long do you pray each day? And the average clergyman prayed less than five minutes a day. 
Then they polled the average Christian in the pew. And they found that the average Christian prays less than three minutes a day. So if I spend five minutes as your leader trying to separate my soul and spirit and to come into the governance of God, and you spend less than three minutes, that means we've got about 23 hours and 55 minutes of the other stuff, or 23 hours and 57 minutes of the other stuff that is conforming us. That's why Christians can become worldly and they are the last ones to know it. Just like you're the last one to know you got bad breath. Christians who become conformed back into the world, they're the last ones to know it. Last ones to know it. They, they just, they, their heart begins to become less and less and less sensitive. And then they come under the deception of God approves of this. Why? Because I don't feel conviction anymore. The reason you don't feel conviction anymore is because you've been desensitized. The other day I was just scanning the channels. I was not on paid premium television. I was just scanning the channels of the, 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 the network and there was a commercial, and I went, oh! And there were two men passionately kissing on the commercial for some new television program. I got sent a video this week that Walt Disney is releasing their first gay cartoon, and it shows like two Prince Charmings embraced in a passionate kiss. Now, why, why does... Our culture see that as normal now because they've been desensitized. In the 70s, that make you puke. And today it makes you popular. You see, you can be desensitized to where what should make you puke makes you popular. What, may, what should make you be, feel sick inside, you get joy from. So here, let's look at the conditions here of walking in the Spirit or walking in our pardon. Galatians 5.16, I say then, walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. To walk in the Spirit means to be, we looked at this last night, it means to be governed by the Spirit. It means to be discerning of what the Spirit is asking you to do and do it. And it means to be controlled by the Spirit. Notice that's a capital S. That's Holy Spirit. That's not human spirit. So Holy Spirit wants to control you. I go to do things at times and Holy Spirit says no. Well, what's wrong with that? That's not the way I do things. I heard, a, I heard someone say to one time a testimony about how they quit smoking, and they had a hard time quitting smoking. Now, I understand that. I smoked for many, many years, and it was a hard thing to do to quit. But this person said that they were one day lighting up, and the Holy Spirit just spoke inside them and said, I don't smoke. And they just, they, they were like, and that revelation caused them to be able to overcome that habit. When the Holy Spirit spoke, said, hey, I don't do that. You want to be walking in me, you don't do that. In the same way, two unmarried young people in a passionate makeout session, the Holy Spirit is screaming inside, hey, I don't do this before we get married. You get ready to take something that don't belong to you. Holy Spirit says, hey, 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 I don't steal. You're rude to someone. The Holy Spirit says, hey, 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 I'm not rude to people like that. I don't treat people that way. You begrudge someone. The Holy Spirit says inside you, you want me to begrudge you? No. Well, then you don't begrudge them. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Do you want me to do you the way you're doing them? No. You want me to be rude to you and you stop being rude to them. Right? Walk in the Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit is He's controlling me. 
Now, he don't make us look all weird and rigid, but he will make us look weird in accordance to what? Why don't you do that? Holy Spirit, don't do that. Why? He's holy, and that ain't holy. So, so the new generation comes out and says, well, what is holy? Not what you think, what he says. See, when you start making up your own holy, you've left his spirit. Now you're back in the human spirit. You're eating now from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil again. You've now entangled again. Now you're being governed by the soul again. Where God's trying to separate us to say, that was soulish. That was soulish. Man, I, I tell you what, I, I, I have to live every day dividing. Every, almost every conversation. There, there's the, the words that come from our mouths, the things that we do, the things that we live in. And, and when we get ourselves walking in the Spirit, he says, here's the key, guys. You won't fulfill the lust of your flesh if you're doing what the Spirit says. Why? You can't have two masters. You can't walk two directions. So you're either fulfilling one or the other. There's no compromise in Christ. That's how we look when we're trying to walk in the Spirit. <laughs> and we're instead mixed up, entangled. Our spirit and soul all tangled up. Was that God or is that just me? That's one of the hardest lessons there is to learn as a believer. A lot of times it's not that hard if you just ask the question, is it holy? What is holy? Well, let's go back and read. So he says, you shall not fulfill, for the flesh lusts against the spirit. The spirit against the flesh. They're contrary to one another. They're contrary to one another. Look at this. So you cannot do the things you want to do. You can't. Why? Because you're being governed by the spirit. Do you want to? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I want to, all right. I just sometimes feel the spirit of slap come all over me. <laughs> you want to? I want to. I told you this, and, and this is one of the easiest examples I know of. I delete more texts than I send. Some of you all need to catch that little nugget of wisdom today, especially on Facebook. You just didn't need to say that, did you? Would the Holy Spirit have said that? Was that you or the Holy Ghost that said that? Well, it was right, but was it in the right spirit? Was what you said redemptive or vindictive? Was that you or God? Jesus does it. You know what Jesus said? It says a smoking flax or a bruised reed he'll not injure. That means if there's a, a, a you know, I, I, I like to watch the uh, survivor, not survivor, but the, the wilderness guys, you know, bear gorillas and, and the, the, the guys that are out living off the land. And how they, they create a tinder bundle to start a fire, you know, the old-fashioned way, whether they're, they're doing it this way or this way or flint. And they always create that tinder bundle. And they say, if we can just get a coal, just a coal, and they'll put that coal in that. And the Scripture says that's the way God is. If he can just find a coal, he won't extinguish it. Will you extinguish a coal? It says a bruised reed. You know, he won't, he, he sees something injured. He don't just break it off. He tries to repair it. Amen. And that's the way we got to be as believers. The way I figured, if you're breathing, there's hope. You say, well, how do I know if there's a coal? Is there breath? How do I know if it's a bruised reed? Well, is there hope? Are they breathing? You know, not many people have much faith in me converting before I converted. 
I was a big surprise to a lot of people. I left one day at work being a heroin dealer, and I came back the next morning as John the Baptist. I was a surprise to some folk. I could have been voted my high school class as <laughs> the person most likely not to ever become a Christian, let alone a preacher. How about you? Aren't you glad that God didn't stamp out that coal in you? Aren't you glad that he didn't prop up that bruised reed and, and, and bandage it and, and try to get it to come together and to heal? Amen? Amen. So he says they're contrary. You can't do it. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. You know, legalism is a big deal in the body of Christ. Just like we have an extreme of a grace message, we can also move over into here where we're in an extreme of legalism. We got to stay where Jesus said, walking in the Spirit. Then you're not here or here. You're right where he wants you to be, being led by the Spirit. Works of the flesh, what are they? God defines what's right and wrong, not us. Adultery. Adultery. That's having intimate sexual relations with someone you're not married to. What is marriage? Well, marriage is a legal binding contract. It's a, con it's a covenant in the scriptures. It's done legally. It's endorsed by not only the church, but the state. You go get married, you have a marriage license. That makes, you, that makes the wedding bed, the scripture says, undefiled. Now, hey, have at her, boys and girls. Have all the fun you want. No conviction. It goes on to say, what else? Fornication. That's having sex with someone you're not married to. Again, marriage being the legal binding contractual thing with God. Say, well, I just don't believe in that. I'm sorry, you're wrong. You're wrong. It's not fun to be wrong, but you are. It's not, you know, nobody wants to be. So some people say, well, you know what? I reject what you're saying. Then you're condemned. You're not just wrong, you're condemned. Because you're not rejecting what I'm saying, you're rejecting what he's saying. As long, you know, if the Bible is not the final authority, I read you the statistics a couple of weeks ago. I mean, there's only a, less than 20% of American adults who call themselves evangelical Christians believe that the Bible is God's inspired word. They're walking in all kinds of amendments. Well, the Bible says, well, I've got an amendment. Well, where'd that amendment come from? My own authority. I believe, I believe, oh, so you've been eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil again instead of believing what the Lord says is good and evil and following that. Somebody put an aftermarket part in you. And let me tell you something about another little part. My vehicle has a warranty, but my warranty is voided because somebody put an aftermarket part in it. I have eternal security. Your warranty is void when you do the aftermarket stuff. That's why he said walk in the spirit. So your warranty stays intact. We have equipment here that has to be fixed and, 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 and operated on all the time. And, and uh, sometimes we have some techie people around here and something will break. And um, whether it's Mike Poor or Gary or one of our, our uh, Nate or one of our guys that's kind of, you know, got that gift. That sometimes we'll call and say, we need a part. They, and there will even be a sticker on the back that says, if you take this apart, you void the warranty. Because you're not qualified. Well, guess what? You're not qualified to start taking apart 
God's word and determining what's right and what's wrong and what you believe is holy and what you believe is not holy. You void the warranty. It goes on to say this. If you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. I could spend a whole message on each one of these words and what they mean, but you get the gist. Idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath. That's where you get mad and cuss your wife out. Or you cuss out the guy and you, you chase him down the highway because he pulled in front of you. Outbursts of wrath. Sudden fits of anger and rage. It says, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries. That's a party spirit. Hey Amen. Let's just party. Now, it's not all-inclusive and the like. This, is, this list could go further, but he says you get the point. This is the stuff God from the foundation of the world has said was evil and that culture, when they follow his word, says is evil. Now, this is the scary part of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past. Now, I want you to read this with me. Let's read it together. Just as I also told you in time past that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, I believe in eternal security. Paul didn't. Not if you void the warranty. Not if you don't follow the conditions of the pardon. You know, when a president pardons a guy, he is free. The Bible says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed, unless we become entangled again. Amen. That's why we're warned in the Scriptures, do not again become entangled in the affairs of this world. See, as Christians, the Lord is trying to create spiritual formation in us. Not just behavior modification. Amen. He's not trying to clean up the flesh. He's trying to kill it and form a whole new system of government inside you called the spirit. Amen. He's not trying to get you to be good. He's trying to get you to be spiritual. Amen. Being good means I can keep enough disciplines not to offend someone so bad that I suffer a penalty or an injury. That's being good. But being spiritual means I follow the dictates, that word's in there too, of the Holy Spirit. It means I'm no longer self-governed. You remember in the book of James, James said... You crazy people, I'm paraphrasing. He said, you guys say, I'm going here and I'm going there and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. He said, you oughtn't say those things. What you ought to say is the Lord willing. I'll go here or I'll go there or I'll do this or I'll do that. The Lord willing. In other words, every decision we make as human beings should be governed by the Holy Spirit within us. Amen. We should check Him. Now, as human beings, there will be those times where we say, I don't have a clear answer. I face this every day. Why? Because every scenario you're going to face in life as a human being is not chapter and verse. So when you can't find a direct scenario, you look for a couple of things, and these are clues in the covenant. Number one, you look for... A consensus of the scripture is what I'm getting ready to do. Does it violate the nature, the word, the spirit of the law of God? 
Does it violate that? What I'm getting ready to do? I don't have a clear in my spirit. Holy Spirit says this is okay. I'm, I, I don't know. I'm in the I don't know zone. And then also there is a place in human nature and in human living as a Christian. There's an I don't care zone. What do you mean I don't care? Do you know that the Lord really doesn't care what color your shirt is today? You know... The Lord really doesn't care what shoes you wore. That's, that's in our... He gives us our individuality and our individual expressions unless it violates some. Now, if you choose clothing that would be more appropriate dancing on a pole than coming to church, then he's got something to say about that. Why? That's not holy. Why? Because he tells us in the word that we're to be modest in dress. So he doesn't care. He wants you to be dressed in modesty. Modest means I'm not provocative. Provocative means I'm not provoking someone by what I'm doing to do something they shouldn't be doing. Hmm? Hmm? I'll never forget down the street one day, I was at our old church. I had a lady walk up, and she was, she was fit to be tied. She was madder than a hornet. She said, Pastor, one of your ushers was staring at my breasts. And I said, cover him up, and he won't be staring now, will he? When you come in, and A, B, and C of a D cup is exposed... Don't be looking at my ushers. You're provocative. How can you know it's a D cup? Because I can see A, B, and C right there. You know what I'm talking about. Pastor Dave, I was, reading my, I was reading my astrology report the other day. You was reading what? My astrology report. You know, every day I get up and I read what the stars are saying to me. Well, the Bible categorizes that and says it's sin. Let me say this. There is truth in astrology. There are secrets that are locked in the constellations that God created. That's a fact. Why? Because they're there. But... It's forbidden knowledge. That's part of the knowledge of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In fact, if you go back and you do some research into some of the older uh, historical biblical records, and I, I, I don't even like to use the word biblical. We call Bible the canonized books of the Bible. Well, there are books that are written that were not canonized into your King James Bible. However, they were used by Israel and they're still used today by the Jewish culture. And, and some of these books like the book of Jasher, the book of Enoch, these were books that have been looked at for thousands of years as accurate by the children of Abraham, but we didn't canonize them. The King James scholars didn't canonize them. But when you go in and you read like the book of Enoch, what you'll find out is the Bible talks about that the angels of, of heaven, the demons, actually the fallen angels, came and they took for themselves wives of the children of men. And they created, they procreated. There was a genetic mutation. And they procreated a race of beings that were called the giants. And there's all kinds of historical records of the giant race, including our Bible. David killed Goliath. It talks about these men would even have six fingers and six you know, on each hand and six toes. They were huge. They were tall. They said in, in the book of Enoch, it said they raped, they, they had such huge appetites. They raped and pillaged the land and they ate all the food and then they became uh, carnivor, or, uh, um, cannibalistic and they began to eat the people and God had to kill them all. And that's all in the scriptures. And it says that these giants... The angels, and it actually gives you the name of the fallen angels who taught men the dark arts, sorcery and witchcraft. What we call today Satanism or witchcraft was taught to men by these fallen angels. 
the stars and the constellations and the secrets that God had hidden from us. It's forbidden knowledge. Now, at, under authority, it's like that, it's like that, you know, that kid that the parent says, you can touch anything in this room, but don't touch this. And then you leave the room. And what's that kid going to do? Everything else in the room don't mean anything. it fell off <laughs> well they would want me to pick it up they wouldn't want me to leave it on the floor I didn't touch it actually the water bottle knocked it off <laughs> forbidden knowledge why is it that we are so drawn to what we're told not to do because of that spirit entanglement that soul where we want to be self-governed we don't want to be told what to do that's called the nature of rebellion it's what happened to Eve when Satan tempted her and he told her there's forbidden knowledge that God doesn't want you to know that because he knows in the day that you eat it, you'll die. Forbidden knowledge. And she said, how dare he hold out on me? And he stirred up that thing inside of her. Now, all of us were born with that nature. But we're born again with a nature that says, you know what? I know there's truth in astrology. I know you can make contact with the spirit world. I know there are dark arts like uh, witchcraft and, and cuttings and roots and all this stuff, studies of, of different uh, incantations and curses and essences. And, and I know that there's secrets in, in the astrological constellations, and I know all this, and I'm going to find out what it is. But God said, I forbid you to do it. Now, under I used to read my astrology all the time before I came under the government of God. But when I read in the Bible... That we were not to stargaze. We were not to have sorceresses or mediums or those who consult with familiar spirits of the dead. When we weren't to do it, I made a decision. You know what? I'm not only not going to touch that, I'm going to stay on the other side of the room from it. I'm not governed anymore by that thing inside me that says, can't touch, can't taste. Can't. I'm not governed that way. When you walk in the Spirit, you don't fulfill those things. It's like, you know, if God said not to touch that, He's got a reason. And I don't even have to know what it is. All I got to do is do what He said, and happy, happy, happy I will be. And happy, happy, happy I am when I do what He says. But if I start slipping... If I start getting close again to this thing, then conviction comes in my heart. First thing I lose is my boldness. First thing I lose is my boldness. I lose that sense of well-being. Fear enters. Adam, where are you? I, I, I was in the bushes because I was afraid. Why were you afraid? I was naked. Who told you you were naked? All of a sudden... We begin to come under that curse of fear. We lose our security. We lose our sense of acceptance. Rejection comes in. Then he says, I tell you beforehand, those that practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit. How do you know when you're being led and walking in the Spirit? We know what you don't do. What do you do? Well, it says you should have love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is, this is what we experience when we allow Him to control us. Amen. Why? What is peace? Well, it's the absence of conflict. It's victory. I mean, the word shalom for peace in the Hebrew means prosperity, 
wholeness, well-being, every whit made whole. Well, what happens is when we do what we're supposed to do, that's what we become. So when we're controlled by the Spirit, then the fruit of the Spirit begins to happen inside of us. What happens when we step out of control? What happens to the fruit? All of a sudden, it begins to be bitter again. Instead of peace, we have fear. The Bible says the righteous are bold as a lion, but the wicked flee when no one pursues. I don't know about you, but if you've ever done anything wrong, I know I have. When you do something wrong, there's that... There is that truth. I remember when I used to deal drugs, I would hide in my home and I'd shut all the curtains and lock all the doors. There was no one even chasing me. I'd hear a car pull up in the driveway and I'd run and peek out the curtains, you know? Thinking it was, you'd drive by a cop and your heart rate would speed up. Why? You lose your peace when you break the law. Fear has now authority. And then we have to come back under the control of the Spirit. We have to repent. And now we have to expel that fear all over again. And allow that confidence of God to rebuild inside of us. And that's a process. I wish it was instantaneous. In the Spirit it is. But your soul gets wounded. And your, your soul has to be again healed. Recovery. Trauma is real. And that's another thing. And I'll close with this this morning. When, when someone has a trauma, and I didn't get as far as I wanted to this morning, but when someone has a trauma, the Bible says that if someone errs, you who are spiritual, restore them in the spirit of gentleness. Let me give you the reference for that. Galatians 6, verse 1. If any of you is overtaken in a trespass, and it's going to happen, guys. I wrote in my notes, I put, not if, when. Because it's going to happen. You're going to live this life, and sooner or later, the devil, he's going, he's going to get hold. He's going to do something. He's going to slip you up, trip you up. You're going to step in a snare, a noose. You're going to say something, do something. You're going, it's going to happen. I've yet to meet a human being that hadn't happened to in Christ. He says, you who are spiritual, that means you who are being governed by the Holy Spirit. Now, don't you get up on your high horse. It says, you restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. You got this? That means the people sitting beside you, the people you meet who once were and aren't, the people who you had so much faith in that screw up or mess up. That says you who are spiritual. If you're being governed by the Spirit right now, here's, how, here's your attitude towards someone who messes up. And then Peter jumps up and says, well, how many times? You don't understand. This person's messed up 25 times. Should I restore them 26 times? I said, no, 490 to start with in one day. Amen. How often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him seven times, Lord. You understand, Lord, this person's been in out of the church more than a yo-yo. has been up and down. They backslide every other week. Every other week they're out. Is there smoke? Then there's fire. Is the reed broken off the branch? No, but it's tipped over. They prop it back up and let's bandage that thing up and let's hold on. There's hope. Don't write people off too quickly. Be patient. It may take a month, a year. It may take a decade. It may take a quarter of a century. But if there's breath in them, there's hope for their salvation. I'm so glad no one gave up on me. You know what? There was a time after a pretty serious church split that I'm telling you, a lot of people wrote Dave Chisholm off. 
And a lot of people said back in about 1993, you know what, Chisholm will never be able to build a church to do anything. Look what he did and look the mistakes he made as a leader and look at the result. But see, God saw smoke in Dave Chisholm. God said, he may be down, but he ain't out. He may be knocked down, but he'll get back up. And this time he'll get up a little smarter than he was the last time. He learned some serious, you know what? Oh, I got to stop. Sometimes, sometimes we deliver people prematurely in the sense of enabling them instead of allowing God to work that full process out. Sometimes God's got to take you to a place of revelation, and that place of revelation may be an extreme place of persecution, an extreme place of something you're going through. There may have been a, a spiritual pride mountain building you and you didn't even realize it was there. And then all of a sudden you find yourself down again. I don't know about you, but I want to fulfill this scripture. And every time someone falls, I want to be the one that says, okay, time to pray and prop them up. Come on, blow on the coal. I'm not going to be your enabler. But I'm, I am going to be the one that helps you. And by enablement, that, that word can have a wrong meaning and a right meaning. And, you know, in psychology, we were warned about enabling people. And that's where you stop the process of God that he's working on to try to restore them. And you try to do it in a human way that is really a perverted mercy. Amen. And I always say, is God extending mercy? Well, then I do. If God's extending mercy, then I extend mercy. If God's not extending mercy, then I don't extend mercy. When does God extend mercy? How does God extend mercy? These are questions we need to ask ourselves when we're dealing with one another. Amen. Because just as you have a merciful high priest who can be touched with the feelings of your infirmities, then you need to be a high, not the high priest, but you need to be a priest under the priest who has that same mercy that you can be touched with the feelings of their infirmities. In every way, they were tempted just like you. And just as you didn't overcome all the temptations, neither will they. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Stand with me this morning. I want my prayer team to come up here this morning. As we transition now, it's not enough to just hear the word. The Bible says, be doers of the word, not hearers only deceiving yourselves. And you know, we have this beautiful process in Christ called prayer where we can ask and the Father will give to us. We can ask and we will receive. But we have to do the asking. We have to initiate. And you know, when the Lord initiates with you through giving you an understanding, then you reciprocate by now saying, okay, I'm going to be a doer of that. There may be people here this morning and say, I'm ready to take the next step in fulfilling my obligation in this, in this agreement, this covenant. You know, when God gave me a pardon, I want to take the next step in obeying the conditions of that pardon. I want to begin to learn what it means to be governed by the Holy Spirit and not just doing my own thing. And that takes a step of faith. And you know, I found, you know, my pastor said it, and I believe it, the pieces don't fit till you commit. Until there's a commitment on the promise, the benefits aren't released. Amen. Till you sign on the dotted line, you don't drive away in the car. This is sign and drive today. You don't even have to bring an offering. Other than your free will. You don't have to bring a check to the dealer. This is sign and drive. You can sign this agreement with the Lord. Jesus, today I make a, a, I make a decision 
that I am going to take the next step of being governed by the Holy Spirit in my life. I take the next step. Now, whatever your next step is, is your next step. It may be the first, your next step may be the first step. That's okay. Take it. Your next step may be, you know what? I've gotten cool. I'm not praying. I'm not seeking the will of God in my life. I'm not listening to that voice of the Spirit. And I'm not calibrating my heart to this word like I should. And I've, I've actually got some aftermarket parts that's voided and warranty in some areas. But I'm going to go back to the OEM. Original equipment by the manufacturer. This is the OEM, guys. Say, so, well, you know, I was reading this book on... Um, I've been reading about Darwinism. or You know, I've been investigating some other things. I've been looking into some Hinduism. And I've been wondering about astral project. That's aftermarket parts. That voids the warranty. You'll have no other gods before me. But you know what? I can pull that headlight right out of my car. And I can put the OEM right back in there. And now the thing's running like it's supposed to run. Doing what it's supposed to do. And when the book says something will work, it'll work. Are you with me? So this morning I encourage everyone, you, if you're here today, and you say, Dave, I want to take that next step, then come and get prayer before you leave. I like to not put you in the pressure of having, you know, I, I, I want to... If you're, for, if you're good, you say, okay, I can do this. I got this thing. I'm doing this thing. And you've made that commitment in your heart. Cool. I'm, I'm making commitments in my heart as I'm speaking. I calibrate every day. And so, but if you're here and you say, I want someone to pray with me. Then that's why we have a prayer team up here to pray with you. No matter what you need, come and get it. Amen. Come and get it. Come and get it. Father, we bless this congregation today. We bless the people that are coming to seek the Lord. They're hungry. They're thirsty. They're wanting more of you. And I pray, Father, that as you have released your heart and you've released revelation knowledge today through your word, through explanation, through these earthly parables that help us understand how the kingdom of God works on earth, I pray, Father, that your kingdom would come today and that your will would be done in our lives. Hands down. Done deal. Contract signed. Today, we sign and drive. We're going to drive this revelation. We're going to live this truth. And we're going to walk out of here like we own it. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray. If you need prayer today, come and get prayer. If not, we bless you in the name of the Lord. Have an awesome week. And we'll see you Wednesday or next Sunday or Saturday.